today I wanted to talk about stock price simulations. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do go, it. girl. Yeah, you want to get into it? Hell yeah. Okay, so last week, which Tom so rudely missed, we talked about some historical uh, popular metrics um, and the pros and cons of each. We talked about historical volatility, beta and CVAR. And today I wanted to look more about forward-looking risk metrics, specifically ones from simulated stock prices, um, and kind of wanted to talk about the actual process of simulating a stock price because it's actually kind of cool and we use it all the time. And I think understanding where it comes from helps us understand the pitfalls a little bit more. Kind of neat. Let's go. I want to see this. Hell yeah. Okay. So um, this was kind of an outline of some of the stuff that uh, was part of this big risk. Um, I don't know what you want to call it, like workshop that we kind of did. And this is the simulated uh, data part of it. And of course that comes from, of course that comes from geometric Brownian mo motion where all great things start. Do we remember our geometric Brownian motion? Of course. Love a little geometric brownie motion. We love a little geometric brownie motion. Um, we talk about this, I think, like a decent amount, which is kind of cool. You're going to sound super cool at parties now talking about your geometric brownie motion, um, assuming a constant drift in volatility. Um, there's a, some assumptions that come when we assert that this is what a stock price follows, such as that stock prices are a continuous process. They have normally distributed log returns. They have constant drift in volatility. And I'll get to it in a second. I wanted to point out the cool graphic. Because what we have here, that first little chart on the left, we have a particle actually undergoing Brownian motion in a fluid. And what you actually look like is the horizontal displacement of that particle over time. Well, you actually see something that kind of looks like a stock price. Isn't that cool? Cool beans. So we got our particle undergoing geometric Brownian motion. But we, you know, this assert that a stock price has certain characteristics, have constant drift and volatility. And, okay, we're going to show some math, but... It has dynamics that can be described by the following stochastic differential equation. This is basically, I'm not going to get into the math of where this comes from, but if we kind of wiggle our stock price a little bit, what is the expected result? And this is what's mathematically consistent with that. Um, so we have this kind of change in stock price is equal to a couple different um, aspects of the stock. So you have your expected returns, your standard deviation of returns, the current location of the stock price as well. As this change in geometric Brownian motion. The actual like equation doesn't quite matter as much. What's more interesting is what approximation we can use to solve this equation. Um, there's a, a discrete time approximation for that given below, and I'll give a translation of what that, this means in a, in a minute, but what I wanted to get away from this slide is that we can actually, according to this model, actually model changes in stock price, projected stock prices, using two components. Component one is called a deterministic component. This is just made of the expected returns of the stock, the standard deviation of returns of the stock. It's called a deterministic component, which means it's actually predictable, right? It's not random. And then we simulate market randomness with this stochastic component, and I'll get into that in a second. But what we can kind of infer from this is that stock prices change with something that's predictable, like it's not you know, totally crazy, it's not completely random, but we add this little market randomness to it. Um, which I think is kind of cool. Does that kind of make sense so far? I mean, the formulas are too hard, but everything else makes sense. All that we need to like take away from this, I think, is that if we want to model stock prices, there's a predictable part, and then there's a random part. That's at least how this model kind of, uh, kind of puts that together. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It's like, you know, a stock price can only change so much from its previous stock price day to day. This is kind of saying that, that when we look at that change, it's not like completely random. There's like a deterministic component, a predictable component, and then an unpredictable wiggle, I guess, what you can call it. Kind of make sense? Yeah, sure. And we're saying in this that this random component, the stochastic component, is driven by a standard normal random variable, ZT, which you guys already know because that's just a normal distribution with mean of zero and variance of one. So effectively, what the stochastic component is doing to simulate randomness is in this calculation, we're taking this stuff from, you know, calculated from the historical performance of the stock. And then we're just kind of randomly, you know, grabbing a value from a distribution. And that's how we simulate our market randomness as a stock price evolves in time. Does yeah. that kind of make sense? Sure. sure. Yeah, that's kind of how we, we also back into expected move. Um, well, I mean, it, it's all kind of driven from the same sort of assumption, which is like this normal distribution assumption, right? right? So we're saying that like if a stock price is randomly evolving in time, it's not like, you know, completely random. There's a deterministic part of it. But if we want to simulate randomness, I'll actually show a numeric example in a minute, which might give some intuition. But in order to kind of simulate this random process, we're literally just pulling random values from a specific type of distribution that's consistent with the Black-Scholes formal formalism, this geometric random motion. Kind of, yeah. 
Got it. Sure. Right. Well, so the translation of that is that each time, you know, a stock price evolves, like I said, there's this kind of deterministic component that's calculated from the expected daily returns of the stock, um, the standard deviation of returns of the stock, and then this sort of, yeah, random component, which is driven by this, uh, the, you know, or that's pulled rather from this distribution that's, again, consistent with the Black-Scholes formalism. That's what I'm kind of trying to show here. Yeah? Yeah, that we understand. Yeah. Okay, let's look at a numerical example because we we like numbers around here. So if we have a stock it's trading at $100, annualized expected return of 5%, standard annualized uh, volatility of 20%. We can understand that, right? Yes. Okay, so if we want to simulate this, right? S not is going to be $100. That's where it's starting from. Mu, right, and is going to be that expected returns. It's going to be five or point being five percent. That sigma term is going to be 0.2. And then if we try to simulate daily stock price movements. Um, again, this is kind of coming from the formalism. What we need to know is that delta T term in this equation is one over 252. That's uh, how we're just going to, you know, time step each day, basically. Again, just we're just taking these values and plugging them into this equation. Kind of make sense so far? So far. So far, right? The numerics yes. may hopefully make it a bit easier. Um, so we're going to take all those values. We're going to plug it into this formula, and then for each. Um, each time step, we're going to pull from this random distribution. That's going to be represented here with ZT. So each time we're going to pull from this random, we're just going to plug it into the equation, and that's actually going to evolve randomly in this simulation, the stock price in time. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So what are you saying here? The um, what I can't read what the move. So those are the prices. So these are the values that we're plugging into that equation. I got right? that. And then each Yeah, time. and the prices on the end are the are the expected move. The prices are the actual movements of the stock price. If we want to calculate like an expected move cone, like if we evolve this over time, then we can actually simulate over time the, you know, the 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 simulated stock price and then from this simulation we can calculate certain statistics. Trying to make sense? Yeah. Kind of? I mean, kind of, yeah. Kind of? Well, well yeah. this, well, hopefully a little bit. I'm kind of, it's, um, there's some stuff in here, but it's the, the back end process of some of these statistics because, well, so if we do this once, if we simulate this over a year, now we have one year's worth of data, right? And then we can repeat this a couple of different times. Now we have a Monte Carlo, right? This is how we do a Monte Carlo. We repeat this a couple of different times. We project stock prices over a year. And now we have a distribution of different possible outcomes and we can measure those statistics. We can look at things like POP, for example. We can look at things like CVAR, for example. We can look at other historical risk measures using this you know, spread of possible outcomes. You can do this with portfolios. You can do this with simulations of individual stocks. You can do this with, you can plug options in here. You can plug a bunch of different legs in here and then look at different distributions. It's actually kind of cool, I think. Yes, uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, it's a good way to get to the Monte Carlo simulation for sure. Well, we got to, we got to, to do a Monte Carlo, we got to know how to get there. And I think the, well, the real reason or the real reason, I think the most useful reason about understanding how this is done is then understanding what the limitations are. Um, because like, right, we assumed we, this all came from the Black-Scholes model. And if you remember those assumptions, we assumed that stock prices are continuous, um, which like, you know, with the earnings, when you have these really big discontinuous jumps, we know, okay, so there might be a limitation there if we use simulations to then, you know, use that for a stock that might be having earnings that are coming up, right? Um, they have normally distributed log returns. So if we're, you know, like heavily skewed distributions, this, we might run into problems. They have constant drift and volatility. We know that volatility changes all the time. Um, so that kind of means that, you know, we want to take some of these simulation results like POP, like CIFAR, that kind of stuff with a grain of salt. Um, but what this also tells us is that we can maybe account for some of these other factors with more complex price models, because a lot of these limitations are fundamentally rooted in how we simulate a stock price. That was nice and light. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun little, fun little stock price simulation. No, it was. I think that's kind of cool. It was. I wasn't, I didn't think that's where you're going with simulation, but that's good. I didn't okay, know that's how you, well, that's how you do a Monte Carlo. I know. Maybe uh, I should start with the punchline next time. How about that? Now yes. I know. Now I know how you get to a Monte Carlo. Got it.
it's one of many ways to do a Monte Carlo. Um, it's a pretty cool um, way to do it. Uh, like I said, we do a lot of platforms. This is how, you know, like if you don't have historical data to use for your, you know, option back testing, that kind of stuff. Um, then simulations are actually a pretty cool way to actually look at different outcomes probabilistically over time. And um, this is something that you can actually do with a spreadsheet. Maybe we'll talk about that next week, actually. That was one of the first, uh, like one of the segments we did a couple weeks back was showing a spreadsheet that kind of did all these simulations, which is a really good example, like in a, in a you know, Google sheet. This is a very good example of a tool that can technically do something that isn't at all built for it. But um, if you understand the process, if you have this model for randomness, if you have like a model for stock price dynamics, then you can actually kind of do it yourself as well, which is kind of cool.